Wait a second. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Conversations With, and I'm very excited today to have Commissioner Daniela Levin Cava and candidate for Dade County. And the reason that I wanted to meet that for everyone to meet Daniela is because you have just been called a mensch. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know what a mensch is, in my vocabulary, that is the biggest compliment that anybody can give a person. It's basically somebody that's really, really good. So you must be very proud to have been called a mensch. And I hope that we have a mensch as our mayor. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's really the biggest compliment Eric can have. It doesn't have a translation. It's like the word chutzpah. Mensch doesn't have a translation. So first of all, I want to wish you a Shana Tova. All the best for this new year, and hopefully we get good news in November. Thank you. So now, you. Daniela, <laughs> welcome. And I just wanted to ask you about, because everybody can read what you've done in the city, the commissioner that you've been, but we don't know about the Daniela and, her, and your upbringing. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Gladys, my dear friend, Councilwoman, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you once again. And, uh, and a mensch, yes, I hope that I can be a mensch, absolutely the highest praise. And as we head into the High Holy Days, this is a time of reflection, a time of renewal. Uh, we're all uh, really kind of in uh, post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome or disorder because of what we've been living through the last half of a year. Uh, incredible, our world's turned upside down. So I am hoping that as your next county mayor, I'll be able to bring restoration, I'll be able to uh, bring revitalization, I'll be able to um, bring back our, our health and bring back our economy. That's what, we, that's what we long for in the new year. I also will tell you, I just turned 65 on Monday. Oh, yes, I forgot to wish you a yes. happy, happy, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very proud, very happy to have arrived at 65 in good health uh, and surrounded by love of my family and friends. Thank you so very much. That's the biggest blessing. Yes, yes. So where were you born? Yeah, I know you came to Miami following your husband. Yes, yes, that's true. Well, I was born in New York, like so many. Uh, here in South Florida. Uh, I was born in Manhattan, uh, near the Cloisters, <laughs> at Jewish Memorial Hospital in Upper Manhattan. And at the age of three, we moved to the suburbs to Ossining, which is in Westchester County, along the Hudson, famous for the correctional, Ossining Correctional Facility, called Sing Sing for many years. And uh, then we started moving around the, around the country and around the world. My dad was an international business, pulp and paper machinery. First, we moved to Vancouver, Canada. Then we moved to Rio de Janeiro, then to Santiago, Chile, later oh. to Chicago. <laughs> I lived in Manhattan briefly, then in, outside of Chicago, then back to New York. I went to high school in Brooklyn, New York. So you've had a very international and diverse upbringing. Yes. Actually, I should say, just to complete the picture, <laughs> that uh, I attended uh, college in New Haven but then uh, in between college and graduate school, I went to Atlanta and I fell in love with Atlanta. I spent many summers and also I took a year off of my schooling to live in Atlanta. And that's where I met my future husband. He was in uh, uh, internal medicine training, his internship residency, and that's where we met. And then subsequently we moved to uh, his hometown of Miami. And you stayed here ever since? Ever since, 40 years. So let me ask you something. Who was your mentor? You know, I've had many, many mentors along the way. And uh, interestingly, I never really acknowledged having mentors when I was younger. I was in a women's uh, leadership program and they assigned me a mentor. 
So that was my first official mentor, a woman named Millie Robbins Leet, who had founded an organization called Trickle Up. And it worked in the poorest of poor countries and it gave individual micro grants to people to start businesses like uh, enough to buy uh, a chest of ice. Yeah. And so they could sell water at intersections, things like that. And people who really changed their circumstances dramatically through these micro grants, uh, the Trickle Up program. Unfortunately, Millie is no longer with us, but uh, she was a fantastic woman who had international acclaim. And uh, since then, I've been very deliberate to find many, many people who I've considered uh, mentors in, in my life. So they come from all over. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it takes a certain maturity to really be willing to receive the guidance and the wisdom. I've also been very proud to be mentor to many, many people. Well, in my case, I have followed you since many years and I think you have been a mentor for me. Oh, thank and you. And a strength thank you. so that to keep on doing what I'm doing and actually to run for re-election right now. So <laughs> yes, exactly. Both, we're both heading, heading very straight out for a re-election. Great. Um, talk to me about Catalyst Miami because for me, this is extremely important, as you know, and you're an advisory board of the Power of the Heels. <laughs> and it is very important to educate the next generation of women so yes. that they can be self-sufficient, financially independent, so we can avoid the poverty cycle. Yes, and I know you. that's something that's something very important for you. Yes, so I started an organization. Originally, it was called the Human Services Coalition. And I started it around the time of welfare reform. So many of your audience won't know what that is. Um, so it sort of dates us. But really, it was a change in the way social services for the neediest is delivered in this country. It, it added time limits and work requirements and restricted who could benefit from cash assistance. Uh, so, so many, many changes to our social service safety net. And uh, as a social worker, as a lawyer that represented poor people, I was very concerned about these changes. And through my work with the League of Women Voters, which was actually my first, um, I don't want to say my first political activism because I was very active in uh, community issues like uh, anti-war, the Vietnam War when I was in high school, the first uh, Earth Day uh, when I also was in high school, the first ever global Earth Day. So, you know, I was active, but as far as participating in uh, elected office, not as a, a government official, but as an advocate and a lobbyist, I learned that at really with the League of Women Voters. So I became very active. I was a board member. And through that, we had a committee on social policy. The changes were happening with welfare reform. And uh, then my friend Jackie stood up at a luncheon and said, we need an organization to monitor these changes. And that's how the Human Services Coalition was born. So I became the first director. We ran it out of my house for a long time. And eventually it's grown into the incredible organization that it is today. Um, 25 year, going in its 25th year, I, uh, it has it worked to lift people out of poverty, to develop leadership in community and civic engagement, uh, and to uh, make policy changes uh, that people, people need to improve uh, their, their lives for their children, their communities. And I'm so, so proud of this organization. I left it when it was 18 years old to run for office. So I've been in county commission for six years and now running to be county mayor. Um, have you ever been able, or what else can we do to close the gap on women versus men, pay yes. $1 versus $72? <laughs> versus 72 cents, right? Well, 72 $1 cents on the dollar. versus 72 cents. Right. Right. Well, some people say that we've come a long way from 32 cents or 25 cents, but that's not the no, answer. No, no, no. The answer is, yes. I know pay that equity. we pay much pay. more. Yes. So actually, I will say I was, I was always focused on issues of women and children, but not so much through a gender lens. And it took me more so coming into office and uh, being contacted 
from around the country with communities that were adopting the UN Charter to End Discrimination in All Forms Against Women, CEDAW is the acronym, uh, we became the first county under my leadership as a county commissioner to adopt that UN charter, which has not been adopted by our country. So all the civilized nations in the world have adopted this, but not ours. And uh, we became the first county since then, Palm, uh, Broward has come on as well, but it's mostly been cities around the country that have adopted it. And as a result of passing that legislation, we've been able to do an annual report on the status of women keeping track of the pay equity gap, as well the, um, the gap in uh, access to health, education, uh, protection, because of course women are the subject of violence more so, um, all of these different areas. And we've worked together with the Commission for Women to make policy changes. So for example, we've updated the sexual harassment policy in Miami-Dade County. We've uh, provided resources to women leaving jails and uh, domestic violence shelters on how to protect themselves from violence. We have a pay equity requirement for um, contractors with the county that they must sign and say they will uh, provide pay equity for women in the same jobs. Uh, and so I'm very, very proud of that work. Many of the cities in the county have also adopted this um, convention now, and uh, we've had great great uh, support from the commission and great leadership from our commission for women. Have you been able to enforce from private companies the equal pay? So that's a great question. And you know, laws are only as good as your ability to monitor. Correct. Enforce. <laughs> so uh, it was at the time we brought it, we hoped that a, a particular um, organization was going to assist us and that on the outside that hasn't happened. So as mayor, I will be working to make sure that we monitor and enforce this provision. And you know, it's also a matter of setting a good example. The county's pay equity gap is smaller than in the private sector. That's because the county has certain policies like uh, we have a pay range, you know, there's certain, so the, the, the bias of giving men a higher starting salary and then higher wages time after time, which is part of the reason for the gap, uh, is, is harder to implement in a, in a public setting where you have set salaries for positions. But nonetheless, we did find in the county as well that uh, women are not always getting the advantages of, of pr progression. And one of the things we did to change it was require the posting of all educational uh, advancement, any additional educational um, qualifications, that helps to provide um, increase in salary in, in the county system. So <clears throat> because um, it, I can't imagine like, okay, the man gets paid this, the women gets paid that. So how do they advertise? And how can they get away with it? Because a job is a job, right? Well, it's, there's a lot of reasons why the there is a pay gap. Uh, you know, there is implicit bias uh, that is unfortunately perpetuated. And, you know, it's not only by men hiring, it could also be by women hiring. By women. It's also true that men uh, are more acculturated to ask uh, for higher salary or uh, increases. And we have to train our women and girls how to negotiate for better salaries. Uh, and that has proven to be effective. And uh, so we also have to, to monitor. So what I was getting at is that if you look at a salary scale uh, in a company, it may reveal to the leadership that there is a gap that they might not have even been aware of if they don't look at it from a gender lens and then they can take steps to correct it. That's great. Um, I remember many, many years ago when I heard one uh, Senator she was a woman and she was saying that men just jump into things. For example, they run for office without even thinking and they think that they can get advisors next to them. Mm -hmm. But women think more. Like we think, how am I going to do this? I'm not prepared. Why is it that we take that job more responsible? Like we think about, first we think more, but second, 
we make sure that we know everything that we need to know before we jump into something. While men just jump into yes. it and just do it. Yes, yes, I, I completely understand and agree with what you're saying. And I have to say that uh, I, I experienced that in my own life. So why did it take me till age 59 to run for office? For office. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I mean, there were a, lot, a variety of reasons. I, I really didn't want to uh, subject myself to the rough and tumble of the political world. Um, I thought I was doing well to serve the community in my community roles. Um, uh, but also, I, I really have always wanted to know everything I could possibly know about a job before taking it. Uh, whereas I think men might go, sure, I can learn that. You know, we women oftentimes want to be sure <laughs> that we really have what it takes, that we know what we need. So uh, I've certainly learned through politics that you can learn on the job. <laughs> you know, actually, it's been interesting because I think as we apply for jobs, I hadn't applied for very many jobs in my life. You know, I was very stable in my, my career. Uh, and of course, we always learn in any job we have. But I think more so in politics, you learn you have to really be agile. You have to suddenly learn how about roads or about the water supply or, uh, you know, about uh, keeping people alive during a pandemic. <laughs> There's so much uh, that we have to really uh, just be constantly in a learning in a learning mode. And obviously we do what we need to, to, to take care of these situations as they arise. Have you learned or what's your experience between what you just said, that you were serving the community before and now as an elected official, do you feel that you have been able to help people more as an elected or before? You know, it's such a great question too. Very good, Gladys. <laughs> Let me say because that what I, <laughs> yes, it's such a good, it's like really because of course we all have roles to play and we all play them in our different positions and you know just uh, like you're in business and you do coaching and lifting up women uh, in your role which is is so vital uh, what about you know everybody is playing a role in keeping our society strong and and moving ahead I believe that the reason I'm effective as an elected official is because I bring along everything I've done before which is a lifetime of community service and the people that were with me. So that now we don't just have me, we have me plus the hundreds and thousands of people who are part of the community networks that I have spent so many years working with. And I call it the inside outside strategy. So now I've gone inside, I'm the one who's going inside to take with me everything I've learned from the people in the outside and to maintain that line of communication because not all elected officials do that. They go inside and somehow they've been anointed to know everything, you know, like wisdom uh, comes from above. Well, yes, we do have to make some decisions based on our own experience and, and judgment, of course, but I will never stop listening and learning to the community. And it's because of my decades of service that I have a, a deep bench. Um, many, many people who know me, who trust me, and uh, upon whom I can call. I think that's where you and I are aligned. Hmm. The, the community service and then bringing it to an official point of view. Um, I know that you have to leave, but I have a little more, a few more questions. Climate change. I know that you have been an active advocate of the climate change And what we're going through, it cannot be denied. There are more named storms as we speak today. We're already at V. I can't even remember when right. we named the V. I know Wilma was the last name uh, storm many years ago, which destroyed my complex. But V has been the top, and now they're even think of the next alphabet. So this cannot be denied, the fires. Yes. How can we help? What can we do? Um, it's very frustrating because I remember when I tried to pass a resolution about the plastic bags, 
there was a big lawsuit in Coral Gables and yes. they lost the lawsuit. So yes. it's- Well, I think that lawsuit is not fully resolved. Uh, it was one at the lower level. It went on appeal. So I have to check in on the status. I think that it was okay. because we were looking very close to it in order to avoid spending taxpayer right, right. taxpayers' money. Yes. Well, let me say, uh, Gladys, we have to do everything that we possibly can. So there's uh, two parts of the equation. There's what we call adaptation, and then there's uh, mitigation. So adaptation is. You know, we need to build our buildings higher. We need to have pumps. We need to have functioning uh, gates in our canals. Uh, we need to um, build it with more resilient um, uh, construction. Uh, yes, more resilient projects. We need to build up our water and sewer systems so that it, it, it will not be inundated. We need to convert from septic to sewer because our septics are being flooded uh, by the rising seas. Um, so many, many things that we need to do to adapt. But as well, it is on us to stop the increase in sea rise, which comes from reducing our carbon. We must play our part. Now, uh, the Paris Climate Treaty, which was uh, groundbreaking worldwide, uh, of course, our current president withdrew the United States from that treaty. Um, I got the county commission to pass adoption of the treaty. And we have aggressive goals as do the cities and we have a countywide plan uh, to reduce our carbon. That includes more solar uh, and less burning of fossil fuels. It means electric vacation of our fleet. Uh, it means building electric infrastructure for charging so that we can effectively do that. Uh, it means converting to solar from um, electric uh, for our, for our uh, buildings uh, and, and many, many other things that we can do uh, personally in our lives and through policy and through procurement. So I have pushed on all of those fronts uh, at, at risk, uh, not only is our future, but actually our water, our fresh water, our clean beaches, our clean bay, all of that. And that's how I've earned the nickname of the water warrior. Of course, we recently had this uh, massive tragic die off of fish in Biscayne Bay, which is a reflection of our failure to address uh, some of these issues, septic uh, overflowing and stormwater uh, being polluting, polluting our waterways, the uh, breaking of our, our old sewage pipes, um, the heating up of the oceans, all of these things contributed to that tragedy and we have to work harder than ever to protect our health, to protect our natural environment and to protect our economy. Because clearly we know that without clean water, uh, we have no economy in South Florida. So uh, I'm going to work harder than ever. These issues have been buried in the current administration. In mine, they will be uh, high up. I'm on the 29th floor, they'll be on the 30th. <laughs> That's how important these issues are. My last question. Yes. COVID, how are you addressing this pandemic? Uh, I know the biggest question in everybody's mind and it's a, a checks and balance. In school learning versus the economy versus the health of the teachers and our students. What's your take yeah. on that? Yeah, well, I've been a big critic of how slow we've been to respond without adequate focus on data and uh, medical advice. We were very slow to shut down in the beginning and we were too quick to open up. We did not take the necessary masking precautions. We did not have the adequate testing, contact tracing, isolation infrastructure, the public health infrastructure in, in place. So when our businesses did everything they were told to do very, very well and to the T, we did not have the backup that they needed to really be assured and to assure the public. We had a spike, we had to shut down again. Now it looks things are, are doing a little bit better, but you know, it's gonna keep being in waves until we have a, a cure, a vaccine, et cetera. So we cannot let down our guard. As far, mm -hmm. yeah. sorry. I, 
no, about the I schools. Think that, but do you think that reopening the schools now in October is opening them too soon and we're going to get the backlash and another spike? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly very worried about it. Uh, I was talking to UTD, United Teachers of Dade representatives about it this morning. We know our superintendent has been very cautious. Um, you know, we're on a downward uh, slope for the uh, infections and hospitalizations, which is a key indicator. Um, uh, but we know as we open up, we risk uh, more, contaminate, more, more contagion. So, um, you know, we, if we do open up, we have to open up uh, with more space, with fewer children in a classroom. Uh, it can't just be uh, the teachers masked. You know, the children have to be masked. Uh, we have to have frequent testing. Hopefully we'll have rapid testing in place very soon. Right. That will be and a game changer. Because yes. if the testing that we currently have, one, have now, the 10 day for a result, it's not working. Yes. Well, the 10 days comes from the labs being inundated and people have been discouraged from getting tested now. They're being right. told if you're not symptomatic, don't go, which is wrong advice. If you've been exposed to anybody with COVID, you need to get tested because you're a, a possibly a secret carrier. Uh, so it is very essential that we have access to these rapid tests. And I am nervous in the absence of that. Uh, and we just have to be extremely vigilant and tamp down as soon as there's an infection. You know, in some places, uh, like if you go to a restaurant, you have to make a, res in DC area, you have to make a reservation. So they have a record that you were there. So if somebody else, if someone comes up positive, then they know with whom you've had uh, contact. We don't have that in place here. Well, so uh, talking about that, my son lives in the DC area and he came from Florida and his neighbor told him that he needed to be tested before he even was out of the door in his house. So 10 days later, they got tested. My granddaughter, one of, her, one of his kids tested positive, but no one else was sick. So they literally called us because we had been in contact with them 12 days before. So even if we were only missing two days, we had to get tested. They made sure that we could not leave our house. Wow. Not them and not us. So we wow. got periodic emails, the restaurant, everything. And here we don't have that. Very good point. You got and it. That, but I want to leave everybody with the thought that the numbers are coming down because I think more people are realizing that wearing a mask is helping. Yes, that's so no there question. There isn't any we need to do more education to let the people know that this is not about politics. This is about our safety. Wearing a mask is not whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. It's about stopping a pandemic. Very good. Very good I point. I know I'm and, and we spending your time. Let thank me know you. what you want to finish with. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful chat. And it's always good to see you. And even though we're physically distanced, let's not be socially distanced. And let us all protect each other. My mask protects you, your mask protects me. Correct. Uh, and we should not let down our guard. Uh, this thing is not has not gone. And if it's subsided for a little bit, that's a good thing. And, it, and that means that we can take a little more risk, uh, but not exposing ourselves or others to Correct. the potential. Of the virus. So if, we, if, we, if we control the pandemic, our economic situation will totally exactly. control So itself. the things, as you say, it's not one thing or the other, they go together, Thank public you. health and economic revitalization. So uh, I'm so happy to be with you today. I look forward to talking to um, all of your viewers, all of your friends and, and network, and uh, we're going to work hard to rebuild stronger than ever. Together we will do it. Thank All you right, so very much. Thank you, Shana Tova, and hope we have a mensch as a mate, as a mayor. <laughs> the first mensch. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.